Okay, well, um, I have a question about the uh, recent appointment uh, to as uh, the head of national security, um, Susan Rice, and um, the nomination to the uh, ambassadorship to the UN, uh, Samantha Power. Um, now, both Rice and Power are advocates of the responsibility to protect doctrine, which, um, like we see with the bail-in policy, where that's the financial policy of the empire, um, responsibility to protect is the strategic and military policy. This was put forward um, at the turn of the millennium by Tony Blair and was followed up by George Soros. Um, in a 2004 article in Foreign Policy, George, uh, George Soros uh, wrote, um, and the, the title of the article was The People's Sovereignty um, as regards right to protect. He said, sovereignty is an anachronistic concept originating in bygone times when society consisted of rulers and subjects, not citizens. It became the cornerstone of international relations with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The rulers of a sovereign state have a, re a responsibility to protect the state's citizens. When they fail to do so, the responsibility is transferred to the international community. And then he continues, he says, if governments abuse the authority entrusted to them and citizens, uh, have, and, and citizens have no opportunity to correct such abuses, outside interference is justified. By specifying that sovereignty is based on the people, the international community can penetrate nation states borders. Now, um, in a 2004 forum, uh, Power commented on a book that she had written, and she had said that my book and my research uh, were utterly unsustainable on the free market. If I hadn't been able to get a grant from George Soros and the Open Society Institute, there's no way that I could have done the kind of investigative reporting that I needed to do. And then also keep in mind that in 2004, uh, Soros put together some $60,000 for Obama's campaign to the Senate at the time, um, and power was brought on board Obama's team uh, then in the Senate. Um, now, so so you have, on the one hand, Samantha Power. On the other hand, you have Susan Rice. I mean, we've seen with this question of Benghazi and the talking points and all of that, but also keep in mind uh, earlier on in the late 90s, uh, you know, you had atrocities in Africa under her tenure as Secretary for African Affairs, which, you know, you had the bombing of a pharmaceutical plant, Sudan, uh, the removal of over a million refugees in the Great Lakes region of Africa by the armies of Uganda, Rwanda. And she had said at the time that, you know, they know how to deal with that. The only thing we have to do is look the other way. So yesterday, um, you know, the neocons are, are, are very happy with uh, the prospect of these two coming into the administration. Uh, McCain gave a speech um, raving about Syria at the Brookings Institute where he said, um, you know, he has great new hopes for the team of Samantha Power and Susan Rice, particularly given that Power had great responsibility in overthrowing Gaddafi. Um, so if you could, I'd like you to address this factor in the strategic situation around the Obama presidency. I think you ought to probably minimize the significance of that. Now, I've been forecasting for some a long time, and I've been right all of those times when I've made a public forecast. Now, doing that, take the one case. In 1968, I first uttered a forecast saying that we were headed toward a collapse, that is an actual depression a general depression of the United States economy. That occurred in the, actually, the beginning of summer 1971. I was the only person, as a forecaster, as an economist, who published an, a forecast on this subject of 68, which came to 71. No other economist in the United States had anything but a contrary forecast. This led to an event in the course of the, the same year in which there was a big event in New York City where all kinds of economists were assembled, including some, some leading ones from Britain, and they were all defeated in a debate with me. I've had a number of these kinds of incidents before. 
The tendency what people make mistakes on forecasting is they try to make mechanical forecasts. They take mechanical factors and they don't realize that what happens is most turns in history occur as total surprises to most of the people who have been experiencing that. So therefore you're going to forecast, you don't forecast on the basis of statistical trends. You don't ignore statistical trends, but you don't forecast on the basis of that. What happens is a social process in which people are convinced that something is true. It happens not to be true, but they believe it's true. They can quote you on all these principles and all these experts and so forth who told you that this could never happen or it will certainly happen, one of the two. And yet, despite that, reality reacts suddenly with a complete disregard and contempt for all those forecasters. Now, that's what I've been up to ever since I made my first forecast in 1968. And that worked out well, too. All of my forecasts of that type have worked out. And I don't make forecasts unless I'm certain. And I know when I'm certain, and I know when I'm not. So I, if, I don't, if I don't know what I'm talking about, I shut up. If I do know what I'm talking about, I will say it at the proper time. And this is such a time. What has happened now? Don't look at all these facts. Forget them. Because there are facts that are stated, there are facts that are unstated. The unstated facts remain unstated, and the stated fact, facts remain asserted. So therefore, what's your, what's your forecast worth? If you can't tell the difference between what you should recognize and what you don't. And we're now in such a time, I can tell you precisely in those terms, that we've come to a point where this Obama has abused, brutally abused, the United States and its citizens and its economy in every imaginable way. He's even worse in terms of his performance than the previous president who was a real bum, who got us into some horrible circumstances and was a real thug. He wasn't very bright, but he was a thug. So that's, we are now in the, that kind of situation where, the, where people are saying, and you saw it in the Congress this week, what happened, there was a sudden revolt in the Senate against this operation, a sudden revolt. They were sitting there quietly listening to this crap and then suddenly, boom, things changed, and the rioting began. Begin what? What are you doing? What are you doing to us? You're doing this to us? And that was what rang out in the Congress. We had also a, a refraction on that from Britain, where voices in Britain of some significance made the same kind of observation. What has happened is that Obama was never really good. He was never really liked very much. But people were afraid of him. And when important people are terribly afraid of what some bum can do, and Obama did a lot of cruel things to intimidate people, and we come to the point, yes, a few senators did try to cover up for Obama, but most of them did not. So we've come to a point of ripeness where Obama is ready to be ushered from the exits or thrown out of the exits. And we've come to one of those times where either Obama is capable of imposing an actual over-dictatorship over the American people and the institutions or he is going to be thrown out.